So we're going to go over the, the molecular biology that's going on with hoplatin viroid. Uh, much of what we know about hoplatin viroid, we are assuming from what we know about other viroids that infect other plants. So um, there, is, there are some leaps that are being made here, um, but I think you'll find by the end of this that um, they're, they're beginning to resonate with what we're seeing in other, in other plants. Okay, so I'm thankful for Zamir actually giving you a, a big background on the bio burden of this. Um, what I'm going to try to do is describe what we think this is doing in the plant, and maybe that will guide us in a direction of breeding away from this problem. So this is a picture of hoplite and viroid sequence through RNA fold up there on the upper right. Uh, it's not very large, it doesn't code for any proteins, it's just a piece of RNA. So what the heck is this doing in the plant to create such a tremendous uh, downfall in yield? The going hypothesis in other viroids is that this is acting through an RNA interference pathway. It makes so much of this RNA that that RNA eventually hybridizes to some transcripts that share sequence homology with it, and then some enzymes, nodins, argonaut, and dicer come in and dice up this RNA and, as in effect, downregulate the expression of genes that have sequence homology to hoplate and viroid. So, when we were playing around with designing primers for, for more optimal PCR with this, I think it was either Liam or Steve in our bioinformatics group blasted this thing against uh, the Jamaican lion genome and came up with all these hits saying, we probably shouldn't put primers here uh, or we might amplify the cannabis genome and have a bad test. Um, and lo and behold, that got us thinking, well, wait a minute, maybe that's actually biologically meaningful outside of just your primer design. Um, maybe this actually has uh, a function going on. So, this is a picture of a hoplatin viroid genome with two mutations in it uh, compared to the reference that was published in 1988. And what happens is the structure of the viroid completely changes. I'll show you a comparison in the, in the next slide. But um, just to get yourself a, a handle on some of the parts of this viroid, there's a central controlled uh, region in the middle, which is, uh, has two overlapping quadruplex G structures. Those structures are generally, we believe, ribozymes, although this, this particular viroid has not been reported to have any ribozyme activity. It's still unknown how this is replicating in the plant. The, the belief is that a DNA-dependent RNA polymerase amplifies an RNA template, which is somewhat um, not very believable, but that's the, the going thinking, is that an enzyme that's supposed to replicate DNA somehow mistakenly re replicates RNA into more RNA, and then this creates a long linear template since this is circular, and that long linear template then gets processed into smaller 256 base pair pieces and then recircularized. And we don't know any of the enzymes that are doing that right now. Uh, now, uh, what you'll notice is we've decorated certain portions of this viroid with the sequence uh, regions where they have homology to certain genes in the cannabis genome. Uh, and uh, that's going to become important as we step forward. So I mentioned that the variance in this can make a very big impact. If you just put two SNPs in this, you will see the structure on the left versus the structure on the right. Uh, this also changes the footprint that it may have in the cannabis reference because we're dealing with very short homologies here, just 17 to 25 base pair homologies. You switch one or two bases in some of those regions and it goes to completely different genes. So uh, the, the variation we need to keep track of in the field to make sure that the pathology of this doesn't shift over time. Now, if you take um, all, everything that we found that are 17 bases and higher, there's 25 genes in the cannabis genome that this has homology to and, and may have some downregulation uh, impact on. So we set out to measure that. Uh, we're going to touch on that a little bit later. The first part I want to touch on is how much variation is there in the population uh, with hop latent viroid? Like, what are we dealing with? Are we dealing with a COVID that's like changing every three months from a alpha to, a, to, a, to an Omicron? Or are we dealing with a fairly consistent uh, viroid? The literature implies this DNA-dependent RNA polymerase should make lots of errors copying this, and so people believe it's going to be a quasi-species, which means it's not doesn't even share the same sequence within one organism. It begins to get heteroplasmic within an organism. We don't know if that's true. I think we're going to show you some data that suggests we're very skeptical of that. Uh, this is a site that we built called Viripedia. Uh, when people are, are testing their, their strains, they sometimes want to submit their hop latent viroid strains into us for sequencing. We sequence them and then put them public so that we have a mechanism to track the pandemic throughout the industry. Uh, and this also does some of the RNA folding information and then blasts those, those novel variants against the cannabis genome to see if you have any novel RNAi locations that may be at bay. Um, so it gives you a little painted picture like this. You can see the color coding on the viroid. Those are the color codings of the regions in the genome that they have homology to. So three of the most common genes that we find is a gene known as COG7. 
That's a gene involved in shoot apical meristem growth. There's another one called expansin, which is involved in cell development uh, and growth, and another one called clasp. Uh, and we'll touch on a few more of the ones that were in that long spreadsheet. Uh, so there's, there's many genes that this is potentially interacting with. Uh, what does the variation look like in NCBI? Well, NCBI has been collecting information on this from, I want to say, the late 1980s. Uh, and there's about 155 genomes in NCBI. And they all vary in length, and they all vary in uh, sequence context dramatically. Now, uh, we've been studying this for quite a bit. Uh, this is what the picture looks like of the variation in NCBI. And every one of those white marks on the sequence are a variant. And all the little dots are areas where there's just no sequence at all. Uh, this had people worried that there was a lot of variation in the length of the viroid. Now, I, I think as we've come to um, study this more, we're recognizing that this is a very difficult RNA molecule to sequence. It's a, it's a hairpin, so it's completely self-complementary in most places. So when you go to try and sequence this, even Sanger sequencing chokes up on this and creates a lot of error. So I think a lot of these are, we're finding are potentially sequencing error that's occurring, trying to sequence this circular RNA molecule. Um, and instead, what we're seeing as we go about and, and, and categorize all these variants is the vast majority of the variants are what is known as CAN2. So Dark Art Nursery, when they first came out with this, said we're seeing predominantly two variants, CAN1 and CAN2. CAN1 is the, is, is the, the PUCTA reference that was discovered in hops in, in the late 80s, and CAN2 is what they're, they're finding in the United States. All the other variants we see are minor variants. Uh, it's kind of hard to see in that graph, but um, the majority of those strains, over 130 of them, uh, have this U225A change known as CAN2. And the rest of them are a bunch of, uh, I would say, perhaps sequencing artifacts or very rare, rare variants. Many of these variants are actually condensing or consolidating themselves under primers that have been published in the literature for people surveying this. So there's probably something going on with Sanger sequencing where we get poor sequencing over the primer sites and we have an, a higher uh, increase in error rate uh, on this. Now when we chart these from the people that send them in, this is a representation of about 18 different locations that have sent samples in for sequencing. Um, these dots on the map actually represent many, many samples that came from that location. For instance, the, the work in Massachusetts uh, from Pheno Express probably represents stuff from all over New England. Uh, likewise, the Dark Heart uh, is a nursery. They probably are getting samples from all over California and the PAC Northwest. So it's much more diverse and spread apart than what you're seeing these dots represent. But the important thing is to see here is CAN1 and CAN2 are all over the world. There isn't one particular pocket of one variant versus another. Uh, they, um, they're in China, they're in the PAC Northwest, and um, they both seem to be spreading um, somewhat equally. All right, so how do we validate a test to make sure we can pick up all this variation? Uh, important thing is that you have very high sensitivity, but we don't want to confuse that with specificity. If you put primers in the wrong place on this, on this viroid, you'll amp you can get some background off the cannabis genome, because there's a lot of homology in the cannabis genome. Uh, you also should have more than two primer sets, because you don't want to put some of your primer sets on one of those variants, and then they don't amplify, and you're only surveying CAN1 versus CAN2 and missing any of the rare variants. Um, RNA tests need a lot more scrutiny. DNA is really easy to predict where your primers are going to land. RNA, you can't really predict where they're going to land because we don't have complete surveys of every transcriptome under every condition out there. You end up with alternate splicing. You end up with circular RNAs known as lariats. So getting primers to work in RNA, you really have to test them against real living organisms. You can't just do in silica predictions. So we've gone through and tested this on 50 different organisms that were commonly found in cannabis to show that they don't interact with that. And we even went through the painstaking effort of, of chemically synthesizing uh, 25 different viroids um, to prove that we could hit those as well. The reality is only a couple of these really matter at the moment. We're not seeing high prevalence of the other ones in the space. The third question is, where do you survey in the, in the plants? And this is actually something that has evolved over time as we've learned more about the plant. Uh, we've been involved in two or three studies that showed really high CTs, in, uh, I should say, higher viroid loads in the leaves than in the roots. All right, um, we've been in one study where it showed higher CTs in the roots, where things were completely missed in the leaves. And I'm gonna to touch on another study that we've been doing that shows some plants that only harbor this in the roots and they don't even spread it out to the leaves. Um, and that may actually shed some light on some of the, uh, the tolerance this is having. Um, so at, at the moment, testing both tissues is pro probably makes a lot of sense uh, because uh, we don't actually know where this is always gonna, always gonna land. Um, but what, we, what can we do now that we know about where the homology is uh, against the cannabis genome? What you're seeing in these gray boxes are the regions of the viroid that have homology to different regions in the cannabis genome. Uh, so we can track for variants when they fall inside those regions to know that if there's a new variant circulating, maybe this is changing its target in the cannabis genome. And then we have a Sanger sequencing program in place to sequence these things very quickly so that we can survey if there's anything changing. 
Um, but in addition to this, uh, we wanted to ask the question of what is happening in the genome from an RNA perspective. When you infect a plant versus a control clone, do you get different gene expression? And does that gene expression give you uh, any sense of the pathology of the viroid? So we took a Jamaican lion clone. This is the mother plant that we sequenced many years ago and, and put the reference public. Uh, this thing is still circulating. Uh, we were able to get clones from the mother, infect one. Now, we weren't able to actually infect this plant. We took um, some of the advice from Zamir to try to use Q-tips and swab viroid on, on cut leaves, and this would not infect. We tried that three times, waiting two weeks between each time, and it would not, and it would not go positive on us. So we finally broke a branch off the bottom of the plant and used a P1000 to inject the viroid right into the stem. Uh, and we did that two weeks later. We were positive in the roots, but nowhere else. Um, so that was just an oddity we, we, we weren't expecting. Uh, now, it turns out throughout the course of this study, what we did is we sampled the roots, we sampled the leaves, we sampled the flowers and the marrow stems in triplicate every single week for 10 weeks and sequenced those with over 40 to 50 million reads per sample. So this is about 80 libraries with um, terabytes of sequencing information. Um, and what we're trying to do is track this between infected and non-infected. And what we saw through the course of time is that this would continue to be negative when we're doing, you know, basically 16 qPCRs every week across the entire time scale here. This was always negative in the leaves and only positive in the roots. Uh, now, what we did start to notice toward the end of its life cycle is that the flowers and the leaves just jacked up the anthocyanin production. Okay, we don't know why. This could be an immune response, but we're not seeing this as heavily in increased in the, in the control that's not infected. All right, so uh, we then, at, we pushed this beyond its actual flowering time and just said, let it see if it dies in the vine and does it finally make itself into the leaves. Like, let it go a couple weeks past flowering. And so as we did that, we began testing, and every single tissue we tested, uh, 57 out of 57 of these were negative if the tissue was purple. Uh, then we found some parts of the plant that were lower branches that looked a little scraggly, like you can see there on the, on the upper, I guess on your side, the upper right. Um, and uh, that particular branch, seven out of seven were positive. So to, after, after flowering time, when we really stressed this thing out, we could see a couple of the lower branches get positive, but the top canopy, anything that was purple and had anthocyanin production was not testing positive for us. Now, we don't have good cannabinoid measurements on this, so we can't give you a good sense of yield other than the growers that have handled this thing for five years do not see a measurable difference by eye of, of the flower weight and the yield, but we, we clearly don't have SEMs and, and HPLCs on this to confirm that. So uh, that, that needs to be probably repeated now that we uh, have an idea of what this experiment might yield. We didn't go into this anticipating um, this, this outcome. So there are some, some literature out there that tie viroid infection with increase in flavonoid production and anthocyanin production. So this, we aren't the first to find this. Um, others have, have, have listed genes that they believe have different transcriptional um, loads when their viroids are infecting them, and they do point back to flavonoid production. We don't know if this is a defense mechanism. Uh, we don't know if, you know, cause and effect here, but it's just an interesting observation that um, these may be playing a role in what's going on. Okay, so if you're not familiar with these types of plots, these are uh, integrated genome viewers. These are plots of sequencing read coverage across particular transcripts. And so what we wanted to see is, is this RNAi happening? Like, if, are, are we going to see down regulation of particular genes that have homology to hoplatin viroid? And when we scan across a few of these, uh, we can certainly see, in this case, it's COG-7. We can see the ones that are HLV infected. There's a, there's a decrease in, in um, expression. But note, the decrease in expression is only over that short window of where there's interaction with the virus. The entire transcript isn't gone. It's just knocking out those, that particular region of the transcript. This was also seen in uh, the CLASP gene. We can see some down regulation of the window where there's homology to HLVD, but it does not kill the entire transcript. Um, still don't know what that means. It's just uh, an interesting observation. This is a bit more of a global picture of this. I'm sorry that the fonts there aren't, aren't very helpful for you, but you can see that there, this is differential gene expression on, on the 25 different genes I had in that initial table and across uh, a variety of samples that are infected versus non-infected in leaves, in roots, and in tissue. Um, and if I could do a better job with the laser here, I'd point out to you some features here, but what is happening is on the left side is predominantly samples that are not infected, and on the right side are samples that are infected. And we're still kind of combing through what all this means, but there does seem to be uh, some trends for changes in gene expression um, based on infection and non-infection uh, in, 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 in tissue specific as well. 
So one question people ask is you have this much RNA sequencing data, uh, what is, did you pick up any hoplite and in there? And we did, we shouldn't have because we use poly-A capture to do this, but some of the viroid is at such high concentration, it comes through, we sequence it, and it's all the same. So there isn't a quasi-species thing going on in this plant, it's one clonal copy of H HPLVD across all the tissues that we found it in. Um, the other thing that happens when you start looking for this um, type of contamination, or I should say sequence in there, um, is you begin asking about the cannabis variation. So we have a large database of 1,834 genomes now that we can then ask this question, are there variations underneath these HPLVD targets that may change the way this RNA interference behaves? Um, and in fact, this gives you kind of a picture of COG-7, all the SNPs down there at the bottom track, you can see it's, this is a densely covered area. There's a SNP probably every 50 bases in our database. So uh, if, if you're dealing with you know, 25 MERS, you're gonna find some SNPs in the neighborhood of these things. Uh, and that's in fact the case. So this is a look, uh, an alignment of COG-7 across just a, a window of some of the cultivars that are in uh, the Canopedia database. And you can see there are variants that exist in the target of homology for HPLVD. These would be nice targets but to basically breed and then challenge to see if they actually have uh, a reduced phenotype of, uh, or, or loss, of, loss of yield. Uh, we can see the same thing in the CLASP gene as well. You can march through every one of these gene targets and you can see that there are variants that exist out in the population that alter the footprint for HPLVD and they're, they're candidates for potential genetic um, tolerance, I would say, to this virus or viroid. Now you gotta keep in mind, um, the way this thing replicates is we're not going to get resistance. It will probably get into a plant and replicate, but it may not have RNA infer interference capacity to shut down the, 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 the actual pathology or the growth of the plant, but it may still be PCR positive. Uh, this is what is ha we've seen in the hop industry. The hop industry's had this problem for 40 years. It's never gone away. Now that we know from Zamir that there's seed transmission, maybe pollen transmission, there's papers suggesting viroids move in fungal mycelium, that they can move in fusarium spores. We're not going to, you're not going to bleach your way out of this problem. We're going to have to breed our way out of the problem. And then that, I think, is what has happened in the hop field. They have found cultivars out there that just have a reduced uh, loss in secondary metabolites. They're not, they're not perfect, but they, they, they take it from being 40% loss down to like 5% loss, and then they work with those. Um, now, a part of this discovery, when you sequence all the RNA in something, is you find out something that blows your entire experiment apart, and that is one of the plants we were working with had cucumber mosaic virus in it. Uh, so this has never been found in cannabis before, and we now have a good sequence of its genome. It is, in fact, in cannabis. However, its tissue tropism is different. While we're finding HPLVD in the roots, predominantly in our plants, this thing is not in the roots, it's in the other tissues. Uh, and it's a lot more polymorphic inside these tissues than hop latent viroid, all right? This has a SNP almost every 20 bases inside of its genome, and it was different enough that the primers we designed to target cucumber mosaic virus off of other plants don't work on the, vi on the virus that's in the cannabis plant. It has mutated itself on its uh, you know, zo zoonotic quest into cannabis uh, to be so different that we've had to redesign primers for this. So, um, this infects 1,200 plants. This, is a, this is, goes everywhere, so this shouldn't be a surprise to anybody. Uh, it is, in fact, a quasi-species. It tends to be about 95% identical to references when you find it in, in cannabis. So um, this is another one that we should keep an eye on. I, can't, I don't think I can go backwards on this, can I? I, I can. So you'll notice some of those leaves and upper lip picture that we missed. You can see a little bit of a mosaic pattern in there. I think that's what's going on, is that plant actually had CMV in it, as we can detect, but we just didn't you know, make note of those. We probably you know, blame that on something else, and uh, here we are. So I think I've got enough time, but uh, so in conclusion, um, we don't see evidence of hoplite variety being a quasi-species. All the literature suggests uh, otherwise, but we're just not seeing it from the sequencing we've been doing. Please send in samples. We'll sequence more and track this for the, for the industry because it's gonna be important in case uh, it does mutate. Um, some of the plants can keep HLV in the roots and remain relatively asymptomatic. This is important. If you're gonna cut and kill every plant that's positive only in the roots, you might lose the plants that are in fact most tolerant to get us out of this. So uh, I understand if you have, a, you have something like this in your grow, you gotta clean everything out. However, uh, in the process of doing so, um, to be aware of this. You might want an isolation room where you can find the plants that have very low viroid load and start breeding with those and keep them away from your facilities. Uh, where you're doing your production, because that might be a better long-term plan than just being on a PCR treadmill the rest of your life. Um, there are phenotypes of CMV and HPLVD overlap. Uh, we have to keep that in mind. We need to do more screening for uh, CMV to see what's out there. Uh, and sequencing some of the mothers and the viroids we think can provide you a long-term strategy for uh, how to breed your way through this. So I think with that, I'm gonna skip over the end of these slides and just thank these people for, uh, for helping us out in all this work. I'll take questions, thank you.
It might be short on time for questions, yeah? Okay, he's giving me the hook, all right. <laughs> I'll be at lunch.